I thought I would read uh, a little something from the book just to whet your appetite for the way this evening's gonna go. <laughs> um, this uh, story is called Love Indian American Style. Uh, the most romantic thing my parents ever did during my childhood involved urine. I was not there when it actually happened. I was in rehearsal for a play at school, but the story has been told to me many times and has been recounted at many family gatherings over the years. It is the stuff of Manviwala legend. Like many South Asian second generation children, my sister Shabana and I grew up seeing little or no physical affection between my parents. Unlike the parents of my Western friends who seemed incredibly comfortable with outward displays of affection, pecking each other on the lips or calling each other sweetie and honey and darling, my parents never did any of that. If my father started a sentence with darling or sweetie, it meant he was attempting to mitigate the fact that the content of the sentence was probably about to make my mother very angry. <laughs> there were rarely impromptu flowers, there were never date nights, and if my father ever told my mother she looked beautiful or she ever told him he looked handsome, it was done in the privacy of their bedroom, or they were saying it for the benefit of their Caucasian friends. <laughs> they were raised in a culture that valued collective duty over individual desire in which marriage and family were not a romantic, individualistic venture. Perhaps this is why divorce is generally so infrequent in traditional South Asian homes. The, pur the purpose of marriage is not to make you happy or fulfilled. For that, there is work, religion, friends, even Bollywood. The purpose is to create family. There was love between my parents, but the devotion came from commitment, not romance, and love was shown through action and sacrifice. They each had specific roles. My mother took care of the home and the children while knowing she could run my father's business better than he could. My father worked and brought home the money while knowing he could cook better than she could. <laughs> they behaved like partners, but rarely like friends, except for on this particular evening. Having grown up in a family that spent the majority of its time outside of the Indian subcontinent, we only visited our relatives back home about once every decade. My sister and I did not know very much about our homeland and culture. The only parts of Indian history that we knew about were Partition, the British Raj, and the story of the Taj Mahal. We knew the names, like every other Indian kid growing up in the West, of those Indians who would be immortalized on India's version of Mount Rushmore. Mahatma Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, and Amitabh Bachchan. <laughs> However, the Indian historical figure we were most fascinated with was not that, was not that famous at all. Moraji Desai, in history books, he's re is recorded as the former Indian Prime Minister who served for a mere two years from 1977 to 1979. But in our minds, he loomed large, not for his political career, but because of a strange and some might consider a dangerous practice. He drank his own urine. Not once by accident, <laughs> but daily as a part of a medicinal regiment that he swore by. My sister and I first heard about Desai and his urine drinking from one of my uncles when we were visiting our cousins in Bahrain back when Desai was in office. The image of this old man drinking his own urine had completely captured our imagination. It was absurd and disgusting, though perhaps the strangest thing was that when we told our parents, they were not more appalled. Don't you think it's disgusting, Mom? I asked. Well, Beta, many people in India do those kinds of things, she, she replied. <laughs> Who is to say? The man has grown to be very old, said my father. So who the hell am I to judge him? <laughs> to each his own, I suppose. Urine drinking was one of those things that as an Indian kid, you hope your friends never find out about your culture. <laughs> <clears throat> Bathing in the Ganges and cows in the middle of the highway are already difficult enough to explain to your Western friends. So it was soon put aside as a topic of conversation. But my sister and I never forgot. Many years after this, I was out of office and after we had moved to America, my sister sat watching television one afternoon in our modest two-bedroom home. The bathroom door was to the right, just visible in her peripheral vision. She heard the toilet flush, and soon after, my father exited the bathroom with a glass of liquid in his hands. Clear yellow liquid. She looked at my father, puzzled, as he stood watching the television, casually drinking his beverage. <laughs> what are you drinking, she asked. My father looked at her for a moment, then glanced at the liquid and sighed. Do you really want to know? He replied. Yeah, said my sister, becoming ever more curious. She was beginning to suspect something very troubling. My father sighed again, and then uttered the word. 
urine. My sister leapt to her feet. What? Are you serious? She squealed. Just calm down, he said. It's not that big a deal, Shab. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. You are drinking your own urine. That is disgusting. <laughs> Questions came to her mind that she dare not ask. How long had he been drinking his own urine? How often had he planted a huge kiss on her cheek telling her that he loved her? Just last week, she had shared half his ice cream. Not to mention the time that she'd eaten his leftovers from the doggy bag of Chinese noodles. She began to itch uncontrollably. Mom, she screamed. Our mom ran into the living room to see what the commotion was. What's wrong? What happened? Look what dad is doing. Can you believe it? Mom looked at the glass of yellow liquid, looked at dad, and said, Oh, Hakeem, are you drinking your own urine again? <laughs> My sister's jaw dropped to the ground. How long had this been going on? As she looked on with horror, mom reached over and took the glass. Well, Hakeem, don't keep it all to yourself. Let me have some, she said, and proceeded to take a big swallow. My sister started to dry heave. It's a little spicy, she said, as she handed the glass back to Dad, but it's actually not that bad. Shabana could not believe what she was witnessing. Have you lost your mind, she screamed. What are you guys doing? This is disgusting. Our parents just looked at each other, puzzled. What's wrong, Beta? Dad asked. People in India have been doing this for years. Remember Moraji Desai? He lived to almost 100. I mean, if it was good enough for him, then it's good enough for us. My sister began to back out of the room, unable to process what she was witnessing. But her mother grabbed her gently by the arm. Come on, Beta, take a sip, she said. <laughs> we are family. It's fine. And besides, you don't want to hurt your dad's feelings. <laughs> are you really going to tell your father that his daughter thinks she's too good to drink his urine? My sister was speechless, unable to believe this was happening. Her own parents had turned into monsters right in front of her eyes. Now stop being difficult, mom insisted. Just try one small sip. It's good for you. Ah, Shabana screamed as they wrestled her onto the couch. My mom held her down as my father brought the glass up to her mouth. Shabana shook her head frantically from side to side to escape the putrid liquid. Finally, a few drops fell onto her lips. Bubbles of carbonation fizzed and popped into her nose as she smelled the familiar smell of mellow yellow soda. <laughs> you guys are jerks, she screamed. I hate you. But it didn't matter. Our parents were overtaken with peals of laughter, both of them more proud of this practical joke one-act play than they were of anything they had ever done together, including raising two children and emigrating. <laughs> it was a moment of complete abandon. They turned to each other and did what we had almost never seen them do. They kissed each other on the mouth. My sister walked out of the room and went to her bedroom and slammed the door. At this point, my mother has always claimed that my father turned to her and said, well done, darling. I never knew you could be so devious. My father has always claimed that my mother winked at him and said, you are a very bad man. <laughs> Hiding your own bottle of soda in the bathroom from the kids? My sister claims that while she sat sulking in her bedroom, she heard my father usher my mother into the bathroom and lock the door. There was the fizz of carbonation as they giggled and whispered like two teenagers raiding a cheap motel minibar. All I know is that when I got home later that evening, my parents were nowhere to be found. However, a note on the fridge read, we went to bed early, there's a plate of food for you in the oven, and some nice cold urine in the fridge. <laughs> Love, mom and dad. Thank you. And uh, I thought I would start you guys off with that. <laughs> well, I tell you what, the, the conversation that you and I were having just before we came out here yeah. uh, about, about the book and, and what I'll call the voice of the book, because you t talked about being trained and having had considerable experience uh, with one-man shows as a monologuist. Yeah. And as you were working on the book, what did the editor of the book say to you? Well, uh, she said, hurry up. <laughs> a lot. She said that a lot. Um, no, she, she actually said to me, she said, uh, you know, I, I came up in the theater and I was trained as a monologuist, like you said, and so she said, you know, I tell all my writers to go out and read their stories out loud to an audience or to a group of people to hear them. And she's like, but I'm gonna tell you the opposite uh, because that is where you default. And it was actually a learning lesson for me to, to learn how to write um, prose in a way that was not, because as a performer, what I was used to doing was writing something and then I get up and perform it and therefore then tell you as an audience how you are to experience what I have written. And this was very different because uh, I had to always think about 
the audience was, I mean, the reader was going to read it and interpret it how they read it, and the voice was going to be theirs, and they were going to hear things. So there was a lot of my editor saying, like, maybe we need more clarification here. Maybe, you know, you understand it because it's in your head and what you think, but maybe this needs to be clearer because the audience, you're not going to be going to people's houses and reading this for them <laughs> in their bedroom, you know, which I did do for a while, and it was really time consuming. <laughs> uh, Ted was listing off so many credits. How many people have seen uh, on The uh, Daily Show? That's pathetic. <laughs> so you were with us the other day uh, on Channel 5. Tell the story if you don't mind. How did you, you know, this is the most coveted gig. Anybody in the world wants to be yeah. on it. I'm sure people audition a million times. You got the whole thing in one day. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a weird day. <laughs> um, I, uh, w and I write about this in the book, by the way, so I'm not going to give away too much because you guys can read about it. Um, and should. Um, I was actually... Uh, having a miserable day where I was sitting on a stoop writing a letter to my ex-girlfriend. Um, one of those sort of, I fucked up kind of letters, you know? And, um, and so I'm writing this letter and I get a call from my manager and they say, oh, The Daily Show uh, wants you to come down and audition. And I, um, I thought, well, I've done this kind of thing before. I've gone in and played like a tech serve guy on Jimmy Kimmel or, you know, <laughs> I played the voice of Saddam Hussein on Letterman once, you know, and it was sort of like, I was like, oh, this is going to be me flying around on a carpet with a turban on my head or some <laughs> stupid thing. And I said, no, I, I'm not going down. And they called back and they said, no, it's for a correspondent, you know, actually they want. And I said, uh, well, I'm not feeling very funny today. <laughs> I remember saying that. I'm having a bad day. Can I go in tomorrow? And they said, well, no, if you don't go in today, this is going to be it and, you know. And so uh, I said, all right, fine. What time are they seeing people till like, and they said till three o'clock. So I literally like waited till like 2.45 and then went down there, showed up, put on a suit, you know, and, uh, and I walked in and, and, and they gave me like this copy and, and I was like, um, you know, I was an actor, like trained in the theater, you know, and so I start memorizing this thing and then the girl comes out and she's like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm trying to memorize this long copy that they gave me and she said, no, 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 it's on the teleprompter. You can just, and then I literally, I remember having a moment of like, this is Kate, what, what? Teleprompter. <laughs> and so I just walked out there and I thought, I'm never gonna get this job. And, uh, and so I really just did, I was a fan of the show, I watched it, and, and I just did my best Stephen Colbert impression. <laughs> and, and I figured, you know, he, he got the gig. So um, <laughs> I just went out there, did a Stephen Colbert impression, and uh, did this piece that they had written for a Middle East correspondent, and I guess then they realized they didn't have a Middle East correspondent, and so they had all these, they needed to audition someone. And John actually just turned to me right after I did it, and he said, uh, congratulations, welcome to The Daily Show. And it was literally, and I thought I was being punked, like it was very uh, surreal, thank you, you can applaud. No, yeah. I, um, you know, it was one of those sort of daily, I thought it was a Daily Show gotcha prank or something, <laughs> you know. Uh, but he's like, no, you're gonna be on tonight, and, uh, and, and, and I didn't have time to tell anybody except like, you know, my, my agents and stuff. And, and then I, we went into rehearsal and I was on the show that night. And uh, it was the weirdest thing because I also, when I went out for rehearsal, you know, we always rehearse the show around 4, 4.30 before we tape at 6. And I, I go out there to rehearse and, and, I, and I don't know, like this is my you know, first time and I look out in the audience and usually it's just, there's a few producers and writers sitting out there, like laughing uproariously because whenever their jokes are, you know, come up, and and they um, and I see this guy in a baseball cap and, and he's sort of sitting there with a teenage kid next to him and I realize as I am rehearsing that that's Bruce Springsteen, you know, sitting in the audience and I thought, wow, Bruce Springsteen works at the Daily Show, um, <laughs> and that's crazy. No, I. Um, you know, and he, he was just visiting, and he came backstage after that night's show and congratulated me on, on my, you know, he was like, I heard it was your first time, you know, you're very good. <laughs> and I was like, you're not bad yourself, you're good too. Um, but it was weird because then on the final show, Bruce performed, and so for me at least, you know, forget John, for me it was very important <laughs> because it was kind of bookended my experience on The Daily Show. And, and speaking of your experience, I, I always think 
sometimes careers come to certain points of demarcation. I don't know if it was that night or the next day. You've obviously had this ability in, in several other things, but this is a huge spot. Did this change things? The Daily Show? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I went from, like, a guy who was sort of doing bit parts on Law and & Order uh, and, you know, theater in New York to, like, uh, being on a show and people knowing my name and stuff. And that was, and also that was the other weird thing about The Daily Show, which is unlike any other gig that an actor gets, is that they use your real name. So uh, I always felt like on The Daily Show I was essentially playing a character who had my name. But um, people thought it was me, you know. And, and, and it was, wasn't me. It, I mean, the guy on The Daily Show was much smarter than me <laughs> and has a really smart team of well, you know, he, Jewish he, comedy writers who walk around with him it, it, and tell he, him what to do. Didn't he have, what would, do you recall, maybe it changed very, didn't he have a title? You were like the Mideast Muslim? I was the Mideast car, so I was the Washington, it was whatever we needed. Now, is Wyatt available? No? Okay, then Asif, you're now <laughs> the Washington correspondent, you know, so it was whatever. But most of the time I would cover like the brown stories, you know? <laughs> um, anything, anything that dealt with brown people or anything in that, in that. You know, and there's never anything in the news about brown people, yeah. so I never had anything. But it was, it was usually that, that was sort of my area of expertise, as it were, you know. You, you write with tremendous affection about both of your parents. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of people probably can relate to this, how your mother, I don't want to necessarily say would compare you, but here's what other kids are doing. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I talk about in the book about this thing. Um, th how many Indians are out there? Do we have any... We have like, oh, three, great. <laughs> Glad, yeah, <clears throat> okay, Mindy Kaling, I'll get more. But anyway, um, <laughs> oh, the thing is, Indian parents, I'm sure like a lot of parents, have this thing where they will always compare you to other Indian kids that they know, right? So whatever you do, the other Indian kid down the street did better, you know? So it's like if you cleaned the garage, for your parents, it was like, well, you know, Millen, he cleaned the garage when his parents were on vacation, so there would be a surprise. When, you know, like, <laughs> if you got bees, then they got, you know, it was always that. So, um, when I talked about this story in the book about when I said to my mother I want to be an actor, she um, said, oh, you want to be an actor like Omar Sharif. <laughs> and I was, you know, 11. <laughs> and so, uh, and this was before YouTube, so I didn't know who Omar Sharif was, and I thought he was another Indian kid that she was comparing me to. <laughs> and I was like, fuck that guy, no, I, you know, I, I was like, uh, so it was a whole thing of like, her sort of explaining to me how, who Omar Sharif was. And, and then, and again, we don't want to reveal the whole book, but there mm -hmm. is another bookend. Yeah. Because what happens with you and Omar Sharif? Well, then years later, I'm in New York and I'm a waiter at a, uh, like a, a, you know, a cocktail waiter, and uh, I he was he was there and and uh, I uh, went up to him and uh, and spoke to him very briefly. It's in the book, and I don't, it's a kind of a great moment, sure. so I don't want to give it away. But <clears throat> yeah, he I, I got to meet the, uh, the, 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 the legend himself it's for, for a brief moment, yeah. When did it occur to your parents, if, if it did, that this was a good choice for you, you're actually gonna make a living doing this? Um, pr probably not till I got on The Daily Show, I think. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think they ever, I mean, like for, I think for my dad, it was always sort of like, as long as you don't come back home. I, you know, <laughs> as long as you don't come back here and want to like want to sleep in your room again, like that is you know. So, um, but I think when I went to New York and and started working in 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 theater and you know started getting regular gigs, I think my parents started believing that maybe uh, that was a thing. But my parents were very when I told them about the Daily Show gig and I said, "Oh, I'm the senior Muslim correspondent." They were completely outraged. They were like, <laughs> that is the most ridiculous thing we've ever heard. Like, you know nothing about Islam. Like, you know, they were like, you don't even know how to like say a basic, you know, so like for that, and I was like, it's a comedy show. They don't care, <laughs> you know, so. Parents, I, I think propelled by your father, emigrated twice. Yeah, they came, uh, I, w I was born in India. 
um, which is where my parents were born as well. And uh, then when I was a year old, my dad emigrated the whole family to the UK. So I grew up in the north of England in this sort of coal mining town um, and, and, and sort of grew up in this sort of working class English, I had this sort of working class English childhood with my dad literally had like a corner shop, um, you know, and, uh, and then when I was 16, he uh, decided we were all gonna move to Tampa, Florida. So we all moved again and came across the, the ocean to Tampa. Did, did you feel you fit in in Tampa? No, it was, a, it was definitely a, a weird place. It, you know, it was, there was only me and one other Indian kid in my entire high school, you know, and uh, he was like in the band and on the baseball team and cool, and I was just like this dorky Indian kid with an Indian afro and who spoke with an English accent. I don't think what, Americans didn't know where I was from for a long time. <laughs> like, I think it was sort of like, uh, I had an English accent, but I looked like a, you know, I was also like 125 pounds and, and sort of, you know, had this afro like this and was, I sort of looked like a, a black girl, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so I think they didn't know what I was, I think it was very confusing. And, and, and there was a particular uh, meal that we often here enjoy yes. on Sundays. My father came to Florida on a reconnaissance mission to see if he liked America. And he, was, he came out here and visit, was visiting a friend and I guess they took him out to have brunch. And he literally fell in love with the idea of brunch. And he, <laughs> he called us in England and he was like, in America they have so much food that between breakfast and lunch, they stop, they eat again. They have another meal. It's called brunch. He thought it was like a combination, he thought it was a third meal. And he was like, 7 95 anything, anything you want, you know. <laughs> so he was like, we're going, we're going to America. It's the land of waffles and, <laughs> you know. Uh, so uh, we, we actually, yeah, and then he loved it. He loved the idea of brunch, he loved eating brunch. He still loves brunch. It's still his favorite <laughs> meal. Like, it's still... And then, I, I, I mean, that's, that's a critical time in a person's life. Did you have trepidation about moving again? Or were you excited to come to, to America? I, I was kind of excited. You know, it was... Uh, I, I was in this sort of British private school at the time, and it was all very strict and, you know, everybody uniforms, and, and, uh, and then... America, Florida to me was like, you know, I was like, I'm moving to Disney World. Like I'm basically, so like the idea of coming to America just felt like uh, I was, you know, coming to like a playground, you know, it just felt like, oh, like it's gonna be, I didn't know what to expect. I, I grew up watching Flipper, you know? <laughs> I thought my best friend would be a dolphin. You know, it was like, I, I really just thought that like, that's what I was gonna live in my and, life. And was, was there any point you became disillusioned or did it? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, in America, you know, the thing I found about America when I first got here was that in, Brit in England, there was always that sense of like, no matter how long, if you were an Indian immigrant in England, it, it didn't matter how long you had lived there, you would never be considered British. You know, it would be like always this thing of like, you're a foreigner, it's kind of the British mentality of like, you know, this is our land and we fought we, we defeated the French, you know, and with, you know. And when I got to America, it was the opposite. It was almost like Americans really didn't have a real understanding of the world outside of America. And there was sort of sense of like, you're from where? Like what, you're, <laughs> you're Indian, what, what's that? You know, Muslim, they thought it was a cloth. You know, they, they, it was like, it was literally like, I mean, I talk about, I say in the book, it's like, that Americans think of the rest of the world the way New Yorkers think of the rest of America. They just don't, <laughs> you know? And so it, it was that feeling of like, of like, oh, nobody really knows. It, you just pledge allegiance to the flag and you're now an American and it doesn't matter your history. So you re, so there's a sort of sense of like reacquainting myself with my own history and background and culture much more in America because I felt like it, it kind of got lost for a little while, you know? I'm going to say, I don't know, in the last 10 years, and maybe it's a longer period than that or, or not as long a period as, as that. Did you ever have the sense that, that being a mu Muslim was nothing you should, just in terms of your career and other things, associate yourself with or not? Uh, 
No, it didn't. It it never. It wasn't. It, it didn't feel about it one way or another until 9/11, and then suddenly it became this dirty word, you know. And uh, so then it was a really interesting thing because I feel like in 2001, 9/11 happened, and then in 2006 I got on the Daily Show, and there was a period of sort of five years there where I found myself not knowing how to express the kind of whatever was going on inside of me in terms of what was being reported in the media, what was happening to America, the sort of relationship between America and the Muslim world, and sort of how that started to, and the narrative that was being created, and the sort of the fear and the lies and the perpetuation of a particular kind of narrative. Us and them, you know, right, wrong, you know, evil, good guys, that thing. And I remember like um, watching the news soon after 9-11 and there was some pundit on some news show and he was talking about the Muslim holiday of Eid, uh, which is like the Muslim, you know, after Ramadan, it's the big festival of Eid. And um, e Eid is spelled, one spelling of Eid in English, because it's an Arabic word, is E-I-D. And this guy was like saying how, you know, if you spell Eid backwards, it spells die. And that this was some kind of subliminal message within Islam. And I remember screaming at the TV like, only in English. It's only in that particular, you know, like it's ridiculous. And I thought, oh, something's gone very wrong. Like the, the like, you know, the, the whole, everything's gone off the rails here. And I didn't know what to say or how to do it until I got on The Daily Show. And it was weird because once I got on The Daily Show, there was this kind of almost this outlet for all the stuff that I had been feeling and been sort of trying to process in my own head. And then suddenly there was this venue that was created, not created, but it was there for me to sort of pitch stuff, you know? In, in, and so that's, yeah, it was very strange. And, and during that, what I'll call that nether period, yeah. Did you think, and I mean, there's probably more important things to think about, but did you think, my career sunk, or I'm, I'm gonna, this, is, this is gonna really thwart my... I never thought my career was sunk, because I thought, oh, there's gonna be a lot of terrorist roles for me. <laughs> um, so, I actually thought, oh, I'm gonna get all kinds of roles. I'm gonna get offered so many roles. Unfortunately, I didn't want to do them, you right. know, and that was, that was the hard part. I did get a lot of auditions for terrorists and, you know, bad guy Muslims and, you know, just, it, it, it was bad enough because I'd already been fighting the sort of like, all Indians are cab drivers kind of thing, you know? Um, and now it was like, anybody brown is a terrorist, can play a terrorist, you know? So there were, there were those auditions which I, uh, I struggled with. And you know, as an actor, you're trying to work and you're trying to just pay the rent. So you, you go, you know, you, you go, okay, so it's a terrorist, but you know, if I play it, maybe I can give this terrorist a, a humanity or some kind of, you know, pers perspective or like bring something interesting to this role rather than just like villain, you know? And then, you know, then you realize once you get on set, they're like, just scowl, just, we just, you know, and that was it. So it, it, you do try to sort of justify it in that way. And then there are some things where I was just like, I can't, I can't do that. It just, it just was too painful to me to do it, you know? Uh, has anybody seen a show called The Brink? That is pathetic. You can, <laughs> Get it on HBO. <laughs> get your HBO, go now, whatever. But, but okay, you're involved as an actor and a writer and a producer on that show. Yes. Does, does that, uh, just continuing this theme of being able to express yourself about certain things. Right. Is, is it part of it or, or not? Sure. I mean, especially the first season of The Brink, uh, which was focused mostly in the Middle East, uh, there was definitely elements of, you know, there's a Pakistani family, I play a Pakistani character, and sort of representing that South Asian element to it, you know, it was, was important to me in, in, in that. And so I'm glad that I was invited to be a writer on the show and, and, and sort of offer that perspective in some way. Speaking of your writing, to the book again, how did the idea of the book come up? Were you approached or? 
Yeah, I, I, um, I became, I was friends with uh, an editor at Chronicle Books, and she said to me, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, I have, and you know, it just seems like a lot of work, and I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of lazy, and you know, and so um, she said, well, you know, maybe you put a book proposal together, and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I have this story, and I actually uh, had written this story about my dad's obsession with brunch. And I had originally written it to perform as a, as a monologue. And, uh, and I gave it to her, and she read it, and she said, I'm going to take this to Chronicle and have them read it. And they read it, and I got the book deal based on that story. Um, and then I was like, yay, I have a book deal. And then I was like, now I have to write a book. <laughs> That's hard, you know. And so then cut to, uh, you know, seven and a half years later, um, when my editor was like, where's that book? Um, no, it, it took a long time. It took longer than I had thought. But it was definitely one of the most, I'm sure you hear this all the time from people who write books, because it, it's one of those things, which it's, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, and also one of the most rewarding, because anything else, in this business is sort of collaborative. You know, you're like, oh, that movie is, you know, there's a million people or that play or whatever. Uh, but the book is like, it's just you sitting with your demons, you know, every day and trying to like write something that people are going to find interesting and entertaining. So that in itself, it just feels like, oh, I finally did this thing, you know. Well, well you did write something that people find interesting and entertaining. Well, it's got you. a ter yeah, terrific I... reception. And the thing that I think is interesting, though, is you felt and said to me before we came out here, <clears throat> be it friends or family or, or other, I don't know, opinion makers in your own world, yeah. when they read it and they liked it, yeah. that enabled you, I don't want to say sigh of relief, but you tell me. It's definitely something about certain people in your, in your life who read it and they give you the, the, the thumbs up, like, I like it, or, you know, then you feel like, all right, you know. I think, I, I believe you enough to like, you know, sort of, because it is kind of, there is that moment when you're writing a book where you're just literally like, this is rubbish, you know. It's all, I don't know what I'm doing. This is crazy and why would it, you know, it's funny when my, when my dad, <laughs> when my dad read it, I could tell he really liked, he liked it, but he had a really hard time expressing it. <laughs> and I remember he, he was very moved, I think, by certain parts of it. And then, and then he, you know, I said, what did you think? And he looked at me and he goes, why would people care about these stories? <laughs> you know, I think he didn't quite understand. He was like, these are, this is like you, our personal sort of stories about our lives. And, and I said, well, hopefully they will. But in, the, in a weird way, that to me said a lot because... I knew from his inability to say anything more, he, he, that, that, that he actually had been really moved by the book because he didn't have any critique of it. He didn't say, well, I like this bar. He just was like, do you think people are going to, like, he was suddenly concerned. Like, he was like, do you think people are going <laughs> to actually care about this, you know? And, uh, and so there was a weird kind of sense of, like, oh, he likes it. He, he gets it. Like, you know, he, he un he's moved by it. And I thought, well, that... that sort of said something to me that, that meant something, you know, that gave me a sort of thumbs up, you know? Which leads, of course, to the uh, losing one's virginity passage. Oh, wow. <laughs> no. I don't know how that leads to it, but I will certainly go with that. Uh, <laughs> did, uh, it, did you hear from either Kate or Diana? No. Um, you know, I've changed the names. Okay. <laughs> um, well, so, in Kate's case, that thankfully. Thankfully, yes. Um, no, I don't think they've, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe they've read it and they haven't gotten in touch with me or whatever, you know. Nowadays with Facebook, I'm sure I'm going to get a message at some point, you know. Uh, but uh, no, I haven't heard from, from, from either of them. Um, Kate was a long, that was like, if I, if, if, you know, that was when I was like 11 or something. So that would be really surprising. Right. Uh, here's the thing, and I think this is why your dad's right. Because though there are some names mentioned in the book, yeah. it's by no means a showbiz memoir at all. No. And did anybody suggest to you, oh, people want to hear showbiz stories? No, not really. The only thing that was sort of, it felt important to write about was The Daily Show. Like, I think, I think people my, <laughs> my editors were like, great, we love the childhood stuff and all that stuff. So we, we need The Daily Show in there, you know? <laughs> and so I did write about The Daily Show, um, but I, I struggled with how to write about it. And, 
not to just sort of turn it into kind of like, you know, um, a kind of behind the scenes sort of like expose of The Daily Show and how we do things and, you know, um, because that's my one man show that I'm doing, <laughs> which is, I didn't want to step on that. Um, you know, but I, I thought, uh, what am I going to talk about? And, and it really was about the sort of idea of me becoming this sort of Muslim correspondent on the show and having no identification with my own religion really prior to that, but then suddenly being overly identified with it in some way uh, and, and the sort of well, this idea that people, th that created that people think yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, the idea that people that you start becoming a representative of something that you're not even sure you should be really representing. And I started getting awards from like Muslim organizations and things, you know? And you just feel like a complete phony because, you know, and then you realize like, oh, it's not about me. It's about actually that, that there are so few people in the zeitgeist sort of talking about this stuff that th th even though it's me and I'm this cartoon character on a, on a, on a comedy show, People are like, that's good enough for us. You know? <laughs> so, it just becomes that, you know. Uh, I, I wasn't intending to, to bring this up, but uh, up there before we came out here, um, and then you told a, a very good, I'm going to ask for two showbiz stories. Uh, talk about being on with David Letterman. Oh. <laughs> so, I, uh, I, so I finally got, I got to be on David Letterman before he left obviously, uh, but it was like, I think the two weeks prior to him leaving, so. That's, a pr that's golden time. And so it was golden yeah, time, it was right. like, oh, you got to be on Letterman, and, um, and I had really nothing to plug, um, because the brink was too far away and hadn't premiered yet, and my book had already been out for a while, but I had created this web series called Halal in the Family, um, <laughs> which you can go on, on Funny or Die and watch. And it is basically, we took a Daily Show sketch and turned it into these four uh, five-minute episodes that were sort of dealing with Islamophobia and fighting anti-Muslim bigotry and all that stuff, but using the, um, the context of a, a, a comedy, uh, a sitcom. Uh, and we play like the Cosby family, you know? And <laughs> it's, this, it's this world that we created, and it was very funny. And anyway, so that's on Funny or Die, and that was the only thing I had to plug. So I, Letterman never does, you know, he doesn't plug things on Funny or Die, right. but, but this was my opportunity, so I was raring to go and uh, got there, and uh, they were like, you know, uh, you don't meet Dave before the, the show, or whatever, you know, and, and I'm just, and they're like, okay, go down backstage, and I'm backstage, a full audience of people, and I had friends there, and, and, the, and you can't hear a thing, because, you know, it's, it, the, the, Paul is playing the music and stuff, and then I... They're like, go, go, he called, he said your name, go. So I go running out there and I sit down, like, you know, up across from him and I'm like, yes, I'm on David Letterman. And, you know, and then I just hear, cut. And the stage manager's like, Dave, you said his name wrong. And I don't know what Dave had said, but he had mangled my name. So they're like, go back, go back. So I go back and then again, I'm like, you know, pumped and ready to go. And, like, go, go. I come out, I sit down again, and now we're into the interview. We start the interview. He starts, he's asking me, and um, he goes, uh, uh, you know, and, and they go, like, cut. And again, we stop, and Dave's like, what's what? And, and, the, and the stage manager's like, you, I don't know what you're saying. That's not his name. It's not his name. <laughs> and then Dave, and there's a crowd of people, there's an audience of people laughing, and, and, and Dave looks at me, and he goes, what, am I, what is your name? <laughs> And then I'm like, Asif Manvi. He's like, that's what I'm saying. They're like, that's not what you're saying. I go out a third time, oh, come back, sit down. And by now, and Letterman has all these notes in front of him that he's supposed to ask me questions right. about that lead me into stories. And he didn't ask, he just looked at me and I sat down the third time and the gas was so gone from the whole thing that he just looked at me and he goes, so, tell me about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> And that was it. I just literally, like, I sort of stumbled into this, you know, oh, well, I was born in da da da, and you know. So it was kind of like I was on Letterman, but it was it was the most bizarre interview I ever had. Did, did, I mean, this happens to a, a lot. Did anybody along the way say uh, Asif Mandi is not the way to go? You know, Bob Grant is. Oh, the, to change my yeah. name. 
Well, my real last name is Mandviwala, so I shortened it already to Mandvi. Um, but no, I don't think nobody said, you know, anglicize your name or something like that. Um, I don't think I would have. I think, you know, I think that this is sort of um, as, as far as I, I would go, I think, <laughs> in terms of, you know, making it pronounceable to white people. So, yeah. <laughs> you have con considerable acting credits and a new acting credit on the way, this uh, Gary Marshall movie, uh, Mother's Day, and you told us the story off the air at Channel 5 the other day, which I thought was hilarious. Your phone conversation with him yeah. and how he was... Uh, efforting to make you comfortable, this movie you're about to fly out and do. Yeah, he, I, I don't know how he found out, but he, 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 we had a conversation and Gary was like, I, I hear that you like peanut butter. And it was like out of the, and I was like, yes, I do. And he's like, we will have lots of peanut butter on the set. <laughs> don't worry, I see if we will have lots of peanut butter, there will be peanut butter everywhere. So I'm about to fly down there to Atlanta to shoot and I have no idea what to, Expect. I feel like when I get to my hotel room, like it's just going to be like right. just skippies everywhere, you know, <laughs> just like. Are, having the success that you've had, are, are there perks you enjoy the best? Is there like, where you, the, the, I always reference this with, with certain people, these sort of pinch yourself things. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, just uh, occasionally you'll just, something will happen. And, you know, you don't walk around thinking like, I should be getting, well, actually, sometimes I do. My girlfriend is here. I can't lie. I usually walk around thinking, I probably should get a perk right now. I probably should be getting some kind of perk. Um, but when it happens, it's always sort of disconcerting because you don't expect it to happen, you know? And I remember uh, we, were, we were trying to get into, like, some party on a rooftop in New York or something, and it was like, you know, one of these New York situations where you can't get in, you know, and there's a million like sort of 20 year old standing there and, and we're just like, why are we even here, you know? Um, but it was like, okay, we're gonna get, and I remember like standing there and we were both just like, we're, this is ridiculous, why are we here? And then the doorman looked at me and he just said, the brink, come this way. And I was like, whoa, you know? So that was, that was my first brink perk. So I'm, I, you know, I'm hoping for more, but that was, <laughs> And we got up to the roof, and of course the party was, you know, what what you expect it to be, you know. The book is praised for for its warmth and and and, and several moving moments. I don't know. I, I mean, you wrote it, but as once you saw the galleys, or as you were reading it, yeah, were there parts that struck you? You're like, wow, this was really, you know, I'm glad um, I included that, or or. I mean, I think the stuff about my parents probably was the most. Um, it was weird, like it, it affected me while I was writing it. So, uh, you know, it, it was, it was uh, sort of ex exposing their relationship in a, in a, in a real way, mm -hmm. not just like, you know, I use them for a lot of comic fodder in the book. And then there's, a, there's, there's stuff where I try to really talk about them and, and the struggle of their relationship and the struggle of their immigrant story a bit. And uh, that was, I think, for me, uh, the part where I was moved while I was writing it, so I, I hope that it, you know, had that effect on people that read it, or I was able to translate what I was feeling about that, you know. You see, the, the, the great, it's, it's, you know, and these are the words that are bandied about sometimes, but I think in, in the course of just talking with you, you're tremendously authentic. You know, and the words are authentic. Oh, thanks. And it, it, I, think that, I think that's what really resonates with people, and I was saying this to him, to us upstairs, that when I told people I was doing this tonight, so many people were like, I love that guy. Like, there, there, was, there was a deeper level of appreciation yeah, for what you did. they do. don't know me. <laughs> How was it working with Jack Black on the break? Uh, you know, I, I don't use the word egomaniac very often. <laughs> That's, no. Um, <laughs> No, Jack, Jack is great. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I came into that and, and here I am, sort of all of my scenes are with Jack and I thought, if we don't get along, this is going to be a really hard job. Um, but uh, he was the most collaborative, sort of great guy to work with, Had, you know, really egoless um, and... Uh, we, we got along famously, and I'm really happy because I think it translates in the show, our own personal 
chemistry right. and friendship. You know, he he was uh, he was just great to work with and very easy to work with. So I can't say there's one time <laughs> one time that I I touched his face without asking him that he got upset. That was the only time. <laughs> like I grabbed his cheeks and I started and he was like he was like and he came he was like don't touch my face. <laughs> um, that was the only time. But it was other than that it was just like and I was like. I, I would hate someone touching my face if they didn't ask me either. But it was one of those things where you rarely sort of, um, it was a little bit of a bromance, I feel like. Okay. We ended up in that, you know. Have you ever been on a, on a, a I mean, I think th these things are, are palatable. Have you been on a set, where it's cold or the vibe is bad? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I mean, it's, that's hard. It's hard to, you just then have to just sort of do your work and you know, you know, you just hope that it trans, whatever it, is that you're doing works, you know, but when you work with people that you don't have chemistry with or you don't like working with, it, it, it's like any job. It just makes it so much harder, you know, yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm Marsha. I'm a big, huge fan of what? yours. I loved you on The Daily Show. I, do, I was just curious, when you auditioned for The Daily Show, you used a, um, uh, what was that you said? Um, teleprompter. Was oh, that teleprompter, the first yes. time you used a t teleprompter, and was it difficult? That's my question. No, uh, it, it, I don't think it was the first. Uh, it wasn't the first time I'd used a teleprompter, and no, it wasn't difficult. It was. It was. You know, I. I like I. Like I was saying, I came from theater where you have to learn your lines. Right. You know, and then suddenly they were like, "Don't worry about that. Just read it." And and I thought, "Oh, this is cake." You know, I mean, there is a. There is a kind, I mean, I know why we use a teleprompter on The Daily Show, because the show is getting rewritten up until the minute we're on the air. So there's no way you could learn your lines, because often the script that you get, and they do give you a script, is the, is the, you're seeing that for the first time. The rehearsal script has completely changed, and the script that you're getting, like five, three minutes before you go on air is like a completely, so you kind of need, so the, the, the trick with the teleprompter was to know where the jokes were and just make sure you hit those jokes and didn't screw, screw that up, and the rhythm of it, you know? But uh, it's, it's, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's different, it's, but it's, it has its own pitfalls, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's easier than learning lines, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm really impressed with how you pursued this career without connections or a background in Hollywood, you know, famous parents, money, all that. It's really impressive and oh, very Oh, did I not say that my parents were casting directors? <laughs> <laughs> you missed that. Part. Extremely inspiring. And I was just wondering, where did you get the bravery to, you know, to, to overcome the fear and feel like you had a shot, even after 9-11? I yeah. know I would have just hidden under my bed, you know? Um, well, when I came out from under my bed, um, no, it, you know, I don't know. I, 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 that's, that's, I, can't, I really can't answer that question except for the fact that I didn't know what else to do. I failed math and <laughs> science and every other subject in school. So um, the only subjects I was good at were drama and English. And, um, and so it was really just that or... Uh, you know, uh, just, I don't know what I would have done, you know? So it, it really, it never felt brave to me. It just felt like this is the kind of only thing I'm good at, so I better just try, you know, give give this everything I've got. So, um, yeah, anyway, I, I think it was just, and, and I was very fortunate in the sense that, like, I actually worked with some amazing people and got to sort of, who believed in me for some, you know, like, like I think John Stewart was one of those people who actually gave me a shot when, I don't know why he gave me a shot, but he did, and it was, I was very fortunate to have that. I worked with great acting teachers in New York. Um, you know, Wynne Handman, who's one of the most, like, legendary acting coaches and teachers in New York. Uh, I got into his class and, you know, studied with him for 10 years. He helped produce my one-man show, Sakina's Restaurant, and put it up in his theater, um, even though people were like, an Indian guy doing a one-man show, no one's gonna come and see that, about Indian family, you know, but he did it anyway. And, uh, and I remember he said to me, because I was gonna leave the show, and, and he said, 
I, 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 you can't leave the show. I've put too much work into getting this up and convincing people that we're going to do this one-man show about an Indian immigrant family. You can't just walk away from it uh, because my agents were all like, you, should, you got the reviews, you got the thing, just walk away and, uh, and go do something bigger and you know, brighter. And, and he said, I will keep your show running for the next six months, even if I lose money. And so, you know, that, even today when I think about that, is moving to me because he put his entire sort of theater on the line just to keep my show open. So I, I, I was fortunate enough to like work with incredible people. And so maybe that gave me the courage, if you want to call it that, to keep going, you know? But, know. but besides that first day, were there other times or things that you remember where you felt John Stewart was particularly encouraging? Yeah, I mean, John, you know, John was my boss, so we never had a kind of, it was never like a real pally relationship, sure. but um, he did, you know, other than the moment when he hired me, and, uh, you know, he, uh, then, then I remember he, he said to me once, because I had, as an actor, you have a trailer or, you know, something on a movie or right. whatever, right? And I'd never had an office before. Like, I'd, I'd worked in restaurants and done that and catered and done that, but I'd never had, like, I'd never had an office before. And so I said to John, I said, you know, it's the first time I've ever had an office. And as an actor, you never have an office. And he said to me, that's because you're not just an actor anymore. You're a creative force. And you want, I want you to remember that. And so it was like this real kind of, moment of like, you know, there we were like sort of, you know, over the chicken, you know, right. you the buffet line sort of, and he <laughs> said this to me and, uh, and, and it stuck with me, you know. Wow. Hi. Actually, you, you just spoke about this. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Maybe talk about, are there other mentors in the business, I guess, that you have had and, and sort of what, what inspired you about them or how have they inspired you to, to pursue your career and then what's, what's next for you after? Uh, well, in terms of mentors, I mean, John was a huge mentor. Uh, I talked about Win Handman, you know. Um, but just, I think also, uh, you know, people who have hired me along the way, you know, theater directors and, and people. Uh, you know, Win, Win was a, a tremendous mentor to me. You know, one of, he was a real, that was a real inflection point in my career when, when, uh, when Win Handman produced Sakina's restaurant because it sort of it was the first moment that I did something on a on a sort of major stage in New York, you know, where I was written and starring and writing this one man show and uh and he uh he just really he really taught me how to be an actor, you know, and how to be a a, a professional actor, not just sort of an actor in school, you know. Um, so maybe that, yeah, I, I, really, I really credit him with a, with a great deal. And then other people, you know, who have, like John Stewart, who professionally took me in, but Wynn sort of, I think, um, was the first person that sort of gave me that first shot, you know? And what's next, is that what you said? Uh, well, The Brink season two is going to be uh, coming out next year, and we're writing that now. And, uh, and then I'm doing this movie, Mother's Day, with Gary Marshall. And um, yeah, and then I'm gonna be, uh, you know, I'm gonna paint. I love, love, love <laughs> painting, I'm gonna stop painting. Well, the, 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 the other thing that's next is he's gonna be signing books. Yeah, uh, that right, so up, right, right up. Up. Hi. Hi. I'm curious, are you gonna be at the Stephen Colbert Report? I mean, uh, would you think there's a chance he'll interview you in his new CBS? Will, will he get a chance to interview me? Yeah, I mean, would you? Well, it's up to me, so no, I will. No, I misunderstood. Let you, him do know. you have? Do you have? No. Huh? Do you have a way to get to have him interview you, or because of your own? Sure. Yeah. I, I. You know, I'll just. I'll just. I'll have my people call his people, <laughs> and then his people will surely have me on the show. <laughs> That's how that works, right. by the way. <laughs> there, there's a lady in the back row. We'll make that as our yes, final question. Right. She's raising her hand. I just want to know how it, how does it feel to have a short story on a Chipotle takeout bag? Wait, I didn't hear that. Wait. Do you know that one of your short stories is on a Chipotle 
takeout bag? No, it's not. Yes, it is. <laughs> Which one? About a toothbrush. You don't know that? About the toothbrush? Yeah. About how... Are you mistaking me for Aziz Ansari? Oh, maybe. Is that... Is that... <laughs> is that... Oh, maybe. <laughs> one last question. She has been sitting here all night going, I had no idea Aziz Ansari was on The Daily Show. <laughs> look alike. Oh. Thank you for coming. Um, Wait. Over here. Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, this is going to be really funny in light if of that. If you mistake me for a season, sorry, I'm brown. Oh, he's up. I'm, I'm brown, it's cool, I, I know who you are. <laughs> I just, um, there's been um, a huge uh, increase in like South Asian entertainers and comedians and writers like Mindy Kaling and Aziz Ansari and others. And I'm, I'm just curious about like, none of, I, I feel like you and, and um, these other individuals are really, you know, uh, performing as individuals and not performing as stereotypes. And I'm wondering how the landscape is changing for South Asian entertainers. Um, and also, like, or, or whether you're saying things still remain the same or you're being asked to do things that you still are uncomfortable with. Thank you. I mean, I think that, you know, it is changing. It, it, I mean, it's clearly changing. We have um, uh, Priyanka Chopra, who's the lead on this new ABC show, uh, Quantico. You know, you have uh, Mindy Aziz, you know, um, uh, as he's writing my book, book for right, me, yeah, which right, is yeah. really yeah. a very generous weird. thing for him to do. This is really generous. Um, so, <laughs> um, no, it, it has it has changed, and I think it continues to change. I think that you know uh, what's been great in in terms of just being a writer on the brink, for example. I think it's it's uh, it's it's important to to have writers telling the stories. Uh, because I think, you know, Hollywood is still sort of, the stories are still about white people, you know, and, and I think it's important to, uh, for South Asians, you know, people from the Middle East, whatever, you know, like to tell the stories of, of that immigrant experience or whatever that is, you know, in terms of, because it is part of the American story, uh, and American stories are not just about white people. So I think that that is, uh, is, is happening, hopefully, slowly. Yeah. <laughs>